know if there's a point to wait for anybody else. 10, 12. I think we're good to start. And everybody else can kind of catch up. So, I had some, a uh, couple of guys email me with the questions. Andrew's not here, or James, right? No, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. They had the questions though. The the thing when it's five or six dumb new new questions I genuinely don't know the answer to. I've been wanting to ask. So well we'll adjust them. He even sent me a picture of a cabin for flavor as he put it. <laughs> so it's kinda nice. So um ready? Yeah, let's start. Are you rolling? Yeah? So I'll uh, start with a little introduction my business. I'm son of a Nick, so Nick son. My brother called me that kind of from the beginning. I'm uh, from family of six, and I've been kind of a outdoorsy my whole life, I guess. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware that Salem goes through 45th parallel. So it's like in Russia where we lived. I'm originally from Russia, so we lived on a 45th parallel too. Oh, cool. So amazingly, it, it was same scenario: mountains and everything, and we've gone camping and overlanding but on a two-wheel drive sedan vehicle back in the day because <laughs> whatever so um but in any case uh, for past probably 10 years since i've gotten my first jeep probably 12 now about um and i came across the jeep just kind of sporadically um we were building so we, we we go hiking whatever and we're like sauna i don't know if how much we get sauna but we're like sauna we were sitting there and we're like it'd be nice to have a sauna here so we're like well let's come up with the idea let's build a sauna in a movable form so we thought about putting an rv trailer or like a cargo trailer and we ended up finding a uh, 78 winnebago 20 footer rv class c the one that drives on its own and we threw a sauna in the back and did all the wood interior or whatever <laughs> had that for about five years and ended up selling it um and that kind of uh was a fun adventure but when i was buying it actually the guy was selling a jeep cherokee he, he wanted 500 bucks for it and I brought two grand bills. That's what he was asking for RV. We bought the RV for 1500 We bargained. So I had the 500 left. And I'm like, well, it's perfect. Let's take it. So that's how I started four-wheeling, per se. Um, always had the love for the snow. But I like the white powder stuff, not the melted stuff. So um, getting involved with that. And then, then I did photography back in the day when I was 10 years. And then when bought the Jeep, uh, it gave you ability to get into more deeper stuff, not just to the snow, but you know, out in the woods. So uh, you can take pictures, and I prefer uh, like panorama shots. So that's my favorite stuff. So, and lately I got the drone. So with the drone, it's even better, and so on and so forth. So, um, my preference and the way I build my rigs are to overland, but be more capable in the snow. So a lot of maybe bias will be towards building the vehicle towards the snow capabilities rather than just mud or rock crawling. I don't like to beat up on my rig, and I don't like the mud. <laughs> she mentioned she needs to have mud on it. No, mud is good, but as long as you don't have to, like, mud, you know, scrape, like, pound. So, um, I'm not sure where to start. I guess everybody is kind of new to this whole thing. Um, as far as certain subjects that you want to touch on, feel free to raise your hand and address the topic as I go along with it. Um, I'll start with the concept of building the vehicle to fit your need. One thing he and I were talking about earlier is that common questions like Nick so why do you build it this way or what do you suggest what not I would suggest start with the stock and see what it's capable of you really learn the ropes when it's stock because you don't get yourself too, too much trouble uh, if you start off with a big built rig you're gonna get yourself so much in deep crap that it'll take a bigger rig even to get you out or you know, a lot more skill to get you off whatever recovery and the recovery is yet costly I don't know if anybody has been recovered in a bad situation, but I mean, they can range quite a bit. Um, I know like sand recoveries can cost up to a thousand bucks, depending how bad you're stuck, whatever. Um, there's a place in California called Pismo Beach. I don't know if you're anybody familiar. It's one of the only sand places in California that you can drive on a beach, apparently. So in Oregon, we have the benefit of driving pretty much, I was going to say everywhere, but it's not everywhere. Um, so in there, uh, they, the rigs, guys build these rigs and they recover like RVs and whatnot. And, I mean, you're talking about they make the bank on the weekends just, just throwing people out. So, um, the other thing is, from a manufacturer standpoint, I know like another bias would be jeeping, because I'm a jeep 
guy more or less. But I've had I've had Land Rovers, I've had Toyotas, Lexus, and whatnot that, that I've built. Uh, but uh, in a Jeep world, there's a common concept of building a rig in stages. So you build it up to stage one, like 31 inch tires, light lift, winch, bumper. Then stage two would be like 33 inch tires, taller lift, rear bumper, carrier, more armor. Then you know it's third stage. 35s or 37s, more armor, bigger winch, more LED lights. Um, and then next stage is like the extreme for rock rolling in the 40s and above and whatnot. So being that we're in a concept more of an overlanding, I guess, um, you have to go by the fact that what takes you to the place where you want to get to. Um, while overlanding, I'm going to probably be on a pretty on a dead, dead on spot where 90% of your driving is going to be highway. So you have to really think about the fact which one you want to be more comfortable with, driving on the road or driving off-road, if that makes sense. So basic idea is keep it comfortable where you're on the road, but yet capable. And thankfully we have the benefit in North America for the most part. I haven't been to Mexico, but I think Canada is pretty close. But U.S. is all the roads are developed, so they're all forest roads. So more or less, um, you're going to find a lot of guys on Subarus. They just get around just fine. I mean, as long as you have an all the drive vehicle, you're good. So from there is basically you go to your bank and see how much money you got that you want to <laughs> spend on your vehicle. Um, one main thing is probably going to be your tires. So you know, the better the tires, the better ability you're going to have have traction. Uh, next thing is armor, depending how heavy you want to go with armor. I'm thinking it's going to be a quick class then because I'm wrapping up too fast. And am I going too fast? Just let me know. Um, on armor, it's really, you have to consider one fact that I heard, I don't know if it's a fact, but one option I heard that every hundred pounds of extra weight in your vehicle will drop you a mile per gallon, from what I heard. <laughs> now, everything is my hearsay, my opinion, so <laughs> do check your own facts if you want to check it. Uh, don't take my word for it. I go by the concept more, which I recently have heard other guys in training do, they say what works, what counts. So on the training that you might do, like for winch training, they're gonna say, never step over a light line, winch line. Because you know, not anything can happen, but hey, if you have to, you're gonna do it. So it's really up to, I guess, the circumstances, how you wanna approach a certain situation. Um, so one thing is basically for tires, I mean, for, for us being off-road is traction is your number one thing. That, that's what's gonna be. And then for after traction, you're gonna look into recovery. So if you lose the traction, how are you going to recover from the situation? Whether it's going to be a winch or you're going to use a high lift jack. I know you have one hooked up. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but you can use a high lift jack to recover yourself too because you can use it as a winch concept, but you have to, you know, it's a, it's a mu muscle hydraulics, they call it, I think. <laughs> so you have to muscle it in. Uh, you can use a come along cable. Um, more specific as far as how to winch or how to hook up winches or recovery points, that's something, you know, that's a separate topic or separate subject. You can talk probably all day long on that as well. Uh, so basically build your rig to what you're going to be doing rather than building a rig to something that everybody else is doing or what you've seen. Because not necessarily what works for one person is going to work for another one. Like he and I mentioned in Russia we have a saying it's the gasket between the steering wheel and the seat. And what was yours? Oh, uh, in IT world it's the problem exists between keyboard and chair. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it's like, you know, who is going to be who is going to be dealing with what? and how they're going to approach it because a lot of people try to compensate the lack of their knowledge by building a bigger more capable rig but in turn like i said you know basically get yourself more trouble so um basically carry the gear that you need to recover and have a plan b and on top of that have a plan c <laughs> and on top of that have a plan e <laughs> and on top of that know where you're going and i mean it's all got to pile up one mo main thing is basically know where you're going and tell others where you're going and i guess search and rescue concept would be basically is you know knowing your locale mm -hmm. and if you go into something unknown for you uh, make sure you have a proper GPS coordinates how you know where to spot yourself and I mean using all that I don't know like I said how, how deep to go into all that because sim I mean a lot of it on YouTube mm -hmm. software wise uh, I use uh, t uh, Gaia Topo I don't know if anybody familiar with that software it's very useful I've used it probably past I'm gonna say probably five years now maybe even more since they ever first came out um, just on the topographic map, you can tell actually where the creeks are, how the elevation works, and um, if you need to hike it, uh, you can preload maps. I'm guessing it's somebody else. Is that FJ? Yeah. Probably Eric with, yeah, that's somebody from, that I know. 
So uh, basic, basically, is you can upload the map in the Gaia into your in your phone or your iPad or whatever, and then when you have no service, it'll actually work. But your iPad or your device has to have a 3D, it's called a GPS, so assisted GPS. Uh, so basically, any cell phone or any iPad with a uh, uh, 3G chip in it that works with LTE service, for example, mm -hmm. it'll work off uh, service and it'll provide you with the necessary stuff. Um, tires, if you go to your terrain, you can't go wrong. Um, I mean, literally, they've, they've proven over time forever and ever to work right. Um, I've used them always on anything that I've built that I went with all terrain tire. I've always put those. There are other kinds that you can put out, that's not a problem, totally will work. Um, Mud terrain is going to give you more noise on the road, probably, and it's going to get you probably 50 foot deeper in the mud than the old terrain tire, more or less. <laughs> and less traction on the hi highway. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit less traction on the highway, especially if you're hitting any icy spots. Mud terrain tires, they, they tend to grip less. Um, you can stud mud terrain tires. I've tried these this year, actually. There's removable studs you can get. They're called, uh, what was it, grip, grip studs or some brand, that I think it was called. Um, I put them in, you can put them in and take them out. I don't know if they're usable more than twice because I, I found them that after one season it's really hard to take out. So if you put them in again, it's probably not going to come out. <laughs> or it's going to be a lot harder to take them out. So um, let's take a little break while they settle in so we're going to catch up all together. What's that? Will you teach a different class with the winching and stuff? Um, I'm going to basically, like I said, this one's going to be like, kind of like hang out and kind of talk about whatever. And basically anybody have a certain subject they want to talk about, we'll, we'll touch on that. Mm -hmm. And then um, if somebody wants to touch a different subject on something else, we'll touch. But okay. we're probably going to, I'm thinking of doing like a separate winching class. Right, that fits in almost any rig without having to modify it, other than trimming it. Um, ones that I've run for, for example, 33s. Any of the Jeep Wranglers, you could probably put a 33 in with probably a wheel spacer, with maybe a body lift. There's, if your vehicle has frame in it, so out of everything here, Cherokee is the only one I believe that does not have a frame. It's a unibody, they call it, so there's no frame in it. So if you have a frame, you can do a body lift, and there's just a spacer lift with different bolts you can put. So you lift up the body. There's no modification to suspension. You just lift the body up a little bit to clear the tires. Maybe put wheel spacers. I don't know if anybody familiar with wheel spacers. Wheel spacers give you spread out wider stems. Um, so this way you don't rub on your control arms or on the, any of the components. And 33s will get you pretty much probably anywhere while overlanding uh, without having to modify, like I said, suspension or you're probably gearing. Now gearing is totally different topic again. Gearing is basically so if you look at like mom bikes, they have gears in the back, they have gears in the front. So you have to look at your transmission as you're probably gearing that's in the back wheel. For example, it has you know, 10 speed, so your transmission is five, seven speed, whatever in your car. Uh, but your pedal gearing is gonna be the gearing in your, tra in your uh, axles. So basically, say your bike is geared to the bigger sprocket that's when you ride in town, but as soon as you start going uphill, it becomes more difficult. So when you gear your axles to the size of your tire, if you increase the size, the tire size, that will give the ability to transmission, to shift properly as it was meant in stock. So you basically, you're passing on the same amount of torque and horsepower to your drive terrain without any stress to it. Now keep in mind that if you go into a bigger si tire size, your braking slows down. Uh, not necessarily a lot, but it, you will feel the difference. Because you know, bigger, so the, what is it, rot rotary motion of the tire, the weight of the tire spinning, there's more weight centrifugal force. So to, to slow that moment, down, if you're just riding a regular brakes, for example, then it, it takes more brakes, so either you're gonna be pressing harder, or overall the system just goes down. Now in my case, I'll go off my example, for example, I have 37s, I have stock, stock braking. I found them to be a little bit less effective, but you just consider the fact that your rig is bigger, everything is more modified, so you, you have to work a little harder. Yeah, you're probably gonna go through brake pads a little bit more often than usual than stock, but then same again, you know, you go bigger tire size, you go bigger load inside, so you get all the gear now. You know, jerry can, you got bigger spare tire, you got all the excess gear overall, skid plates, armor, blah, 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 you add on extra probably 1,000 pounds, so you have to really consider the fact of what your vehicle is capable of carrying payload wise as well. Uh, one example, I had a Land Rover LR3 Discovery. Those have, um, I believe it's air suspension. 
if I remember correct. Um, that one had payload, if I remember correct, was like 1,200 pounds. So by the time you load it up, your air suspension can handle it. Uh, or whatever suspension, if it's like hydraulic or air suspension. If it's a stock suspension, your springs are going to start sagging. So keep in mind, by adding a front bumper and a winch, you're talking about 100, 150 pounds. Your front end is going to dip. So when you brake, your front end is going to dip even more. But, I mean, all that is going to go in there. So 33s are probably have been ideal. Uh, I've run 33s in multiple vehicles, like Cherokee, I've done with a 4 inch lift, no gearing was needed. Um, your 4 low becomes more like 4 medium, because you don't have that, uh, the gearing down effect as much. Um, and then, so basically the, the rig feels a little bit less speed wise, less force than that. But it's still, you know, you get more capability. And overlanding is what? It's about the journey, not about the destination for the most part, probably. <laughs> so, um, but keep in mind always, anything that you build on, you have to consider the weakest link. So uh, anything you modify is going to come down to something's going to change over the time to what your weakest link is. And you have to probably consider the fact that what you, what you want the weakest link to be. The cheaper the part, the easier to replace, the, the cheaper on the pocket. Because if you modify everything and you're going to make your weakest link the most expensive part, it's the one that's going to break down somewhere in the middle of the desert, so you're going to have to give a bigger tow bill and a repair bill, rather than, I don't know, cheap $20 U-joint on your driveline, for example. Mm -hmm. you know. So something like that. So 33s, that's where probably everybody started. Um, in overlanding, I've known that, I don't know how many of you guys follow anybody that does a lot of overlanding. In, on Instagram, there's Overland Americas group. A couple, they're doing South America now. Are you familiar with them? No? Awesome. You're your head, so. uh, they're from Seattle. They've been, they have a forerunner, a little bit newer than this one. Um, gosh, they're going on their third year now, I think. Yeah, they're living out of rooftop tent for the most part. Um, and it's probably just modified with a plus one tire. That's it. So you're talking about just basically a stuck rig with a rear locker and a winch and a bumper in the front. I'm not sure if, I can't remember if they carry their, um, the rear, if they have the rear bumper modified or not. But it doesn't take much to overland. And most overlanders, the guys that, if you, here on the news that people have been going around for 30 some years. There's a couple on old G Wagon from Germany or uh, Europe somewhere. They have the diesel G Wagon two door Mercedes, like a military rig style rig. They've been out for 30 years. They started with like, hey, wife, let's take a vacation for like two, three months. And then they went in for six and then nine and then the year. And then they're like, well, let's never go home. <laughs> so they've been on, on the road for 30 years. And they run, run basically, I think, like a 28, 29 inch tire. So I mean, basically, as stuck as you can. Um, so there's really no need to modify your vehicle to be more than it is in stock other than getting good tires. Uh, that's the one thing. A lot of guys in Australia, for example, you'll see probably they carry two spares. So it all depends on the, how much of a risk you're running for punctures. That will be probably the issue. Um, a lot of people ask me why don't I carry a spare. I do snow wheeling mainly, as I mentioned. So it's the weight is an issue. Um, with a 37 inch tire like that, to slice it, to, to, dice it, to damage it. It takes a lot, so if you're careful enough in the snow, especially your main risk is puncturing probably with like a tree branch sticking out through the snow that you don't, you don't see what not. Uh, we actually had the guy in February on the same size 37 slice a gas like that on a tire in the snow. But if you go off the trail, kind of you know when the trail kicks you off or something, that's a risk you, you can always run into. But basically, knowing where you're going and knowing having a good buddy who could bring you a spare tire, <laughs> <in the> worst <laughs> case. Uh, but keeping the vehicle's weight down is going to be a big, big bonus overall. So don't really carry anything you don't really need to, um, but do carry everything that you need. So that's <laughs> a good one. Uh, question, another one, he said family friendly. What does a family friendly trip mean? And he says, uh, I get that it means kid friendly, but it doesn't mean anybody, uh, that means nobody drinks and goes to bed by 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's really up to the group, I guess. I mean, for all I care, we can have a shot right now and keep going, I guess, or <laughs> vice versa, you know. I mean, it's, it's really, Family friendly, I guess it's an outing where you have, you know, family. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's, you know, no swearing, no bad, no foul language, and just everybody minding the children and animals and dogs and cats or whoever, you know, whoever wants to bring everybody. So, I mean, it's basically what it means, you know, family friendly party, I guess, kind of like that. So, uh, another one, uh, we're going to go into body armor. How important is full armor under your rig compared to stock brush guard sliders? I don't see it on the most rides and it adds lots of weight so that's the back to the weight question is how much weight you want to put on your vehicle and really like what skid plays do you want to 
worry about or get or protect. Um, it's going to be case by case. Certain vehicles have certain weak links in the un under armor, or not under armor, I'll say undercarriage. So I know one thing for uh, Wranglers, um, I think it's called like Evap can Canister. Who got the Jeep Wrangler here? You have, and then Alex, where's Alex? I think back. there's armor under the under the canister. Yeah, there is, but it's supposed supposedly it's very weak. Okay. So if you're going cr like rock crawling for the main part, you have to look at the fact you want to protect that as much as you can. Yeah. One other thing, um, I'm pretty tight with the jeeping community in Russia, and I had a couple of friends take a Mongolia trip. So in Mongolia, they ended up almost setting uh, Wrangler on fire. Well, they did. Uh, <laughs> it, it became in, in ca like undrivable they had to tow it out for repairs whatnot so what happens is if you drive it through tall brush mm -hmm. the grass will wrap around the drive line mm -hmm. oh. and the exhaust line is there mm -hmm. and the f fuel tank is there and the fuel lines are very easily i guess ripped off <laughs> they're not very protected so that's something <laughs> and i think that's on any vehicle if you're going through brush you want to keep in mind especially if it's like dry season summer I don't know, you're somewhere in the middle of Hell's Canyon or something, or Skins Mountains, you know, you're climbing somewhere where there's deep brush. You have to keep in mind, again, if you're off the road, off the trail kind of thing, you have to keep those things in mind. For desert, one thing also keep in mind for snakes. <laughs> they like to get up and coil up or in your, uh, under the hood to warm up, oh and wow. stop stationary. And when you wake up in the morning, a lot of people like to check under hood. Keep that in mind too. <laughs> so. Ross location trail system outside of the road, uh, the road parks like Browns Camp, where challenging trails are the point within a 10 day journey in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, North Cali radius. What are the what are the most technical challenges I can uh, really expect on the most off payment routes? I'm going to say none as far as challenges. Um, really, your, ba your basic challenge will be probably if it's like a washout or you're going to have a rock fall. And that's where you have to go basis, basis by basis where do you want to drive around it, do you want to clear up and keep going, do you want to scout another mile, maybe just take a hike and see if something's there that's worse and it's not even worth it to take this one apart. Um, I've done moving huge boulders off the road to, uh, to kind of clear the path, whatnot, if you can't drive them around. Um, keep in mind they, they go into tons, so they're very heavy and you have to keep in mind that um, when you're moving them, I had an incident where I got it too close to the road and it started pulling my leg. So I had to pull the knife out and cut the strap and the rock kind of just shifted down more. Oh, oh, wow. So more or less your rig can't go down the hill with the rock probably. <laughs> so um, as far as trails, Browns Camp probably going to be best learning ground. So anybody wants to just kind of see how the rig is capable of doing. Um, but it gets too busy. I don't like that. Part of it is kind of people front up on you like what are you doing here on a stuck rig trying to do whatever road you have to do. Everybody's new at it, it's different. So places like this, how I found it is just Google map it, drop it out, query, come out here. I bet you that 99% of your technical learning you can do probably here. I mean there's you know, ponds and there's you know, gravel that you can drive over, there's loose rock up there, you can try climbing up there just to see what your capabilities are. Um, so not much of need to go anywhere far or where it's going to be difficult to learn on a level with that. Um, so for the most part, just learn as you go and don't try to have anybody push you to kind of learn faster than you want to learn now, right? Like three or four we've done. Uh, winter camping is not as bad as everybody thinks. And I guess it's basically, it's not the bad weather, it's the bad gear that you have with you. So if you want to do winter camping, you got to get winter clothing, you got to get heater, you got to you know, accessorize yourself for itself. Um, it doesn't <coughs> get much different than your regular summer camping. I mean, you still bring a tent, you still bring a sleeping bag, you still bring a pad or cot, uh, you know, still cooking utensils. But for winter, you're probably going to bring a cooler to keep your food from, un from freezing rather than going bad. <laughs> uh, heaters, uh, look into like the body heaters. They work pretty good. Uh, for the most part, if your tent is fairly small, um, either a small body heater or uh, I think this called big buddy so it's a, a two, two coil one with the two tanks on the sides um, that one can heat up pretty good tent um, tents again keep keep in mind that you know how you're gonna unpack it depending if it's cold how comfortable your fingers are gonna get cold and all that I mean see everybody's already yeah. telling <laughs> up my fingers are getting cold so uh, you know when, when it's cold you're like oh, you start frustrating or whatever so tent 
try to unfold it obviously when it's comfortable, either in your garage or in the summertime. Understand how your tent is gonna, you know, how you can put it up and how you take it down. And when you take it down, it's probably gonna be wet. So you, that's another one. How are you gonna pack it? You wanna bring a big garbage bag to put it in, to dry it at home and then pack it up. Um, and then again, in the winter, you wanna be more comfortable changing the clothing. So you wanna have more space. So if you get uh, one of those um, Alpine tents, like the two person tent, small one, and that one is gonna be warmer probably with a smaller heater but you're gonna have a hard time just getting comfortable to change or to undress or you know whatever it is um, and then sleeping bags keep in mind that uh, if it's a zero degree bag it doesn't mean it'll keep you warm till zero the zero degrees it's maximum capacity which I think they say it's about 50 degree difference so basically 50 degrees before it's raining that's where it's comfortable after that it starts losing its comfort so you're gonna have more layers of clothing or whatever and sleeping bags mostly they're meant in my opinion, and I've heard that from others too, is that your body heat's supposed to keep them warm. So if you have to put three, four, five layers of clothing, your, your sleeping bag is just protecting you from the outside more or less, but it's not keeping you warm. Your body heat's not getting inside the bag to reflect it back to you. So most sleeping bags, uh, one system, I don't know if you use the military one. No. No? Uh, John has one. Though. Yeah. I suggested, I suggested to, uh, one I used for myself is military sleeping bag. It's a three layer bag, so it has a, summer bag and has a winter bag so there's two sleeping bags and then the Gore-Tex BB over it so you can actually just sleep under rain under snow whatever in that bag it's rated to 50 below so it gets you pretty toasty actually uh, as long as you have a proper pad underneath you should be able to sleep I slept just literally right on top of the snow in a sleeping bag with just under armor and that's it um, in the warmer temps you just sleep in your undies because your body heat really just goes out and comes right back to you um, then you, you know, you have to look in if you want to like the, um, what are they called, the cocoon bags, so they're tight on the, on the feet, or you want to get a wider one, you got to have more space to heat, but, you know, you can spread your legs out however you like, whatever, cuddle up with a partner in there, or whatever, you know. Um, so that's uh, really winter camping, I found for myself, um, Eric's seen it, um, canopy tents, Costco cells, white canopy square, they're, I think they're 12 by 12, they have all four walls. It's easy to set up, just pull the frame, one man can do it, put it together to dry it, you just unfold a little bit in the garage, it dries out, you can put it away. They're like 200 bucks I think in Costco, I don't know, have you looked at it? No. Um, I think last time I've seen them, they were 200 bucks, and the one I have probably close to over 10 years at least, and served me well. I mean, if you treat the zippers right and everything works right, you, know, you, you don't let it mold up or whatever, it'll work well. And it's nice because you can stand up on it. I mean, it's probably what, eight feet up top space. I mean, I usually end up setting up my cot, my kitchen, uh, my camp chair, you know, you choose comfortable and you can easily do two people in there probably. All right. Um, so um, basically just those things you want to consider in any circumstance you want to put yourself into like, okay, so am I going to feel comfortable under those circumstances? Um, winter camping, one thing is and uh, probably any trip that you you would to do, for example, I would consider the fact that you always want to have the call buddy, just somebody to contact. Hey, I'm going there. If I don't come back by so and so time, come look for me. Right. And you want to understand, you know, you want to comprehend the fact that they comprehend where you're going, and you want to comprehend <laughs> the fact that they know how to get there, <laughs> and they're going to be able to actually get to you and rescue you in the, in the worst case scenario. And in the worst case, maybe you know, if you hike out, and you can call them, whatever. Um, so yeah, body system is definitely a good one. And a lot of people, I think, are more than happy to come out and get you if anything happens. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, on locations, I didn't finish. Um, as far as where to go, a few of the places that I found overlanding good in Oregon specifically, for example, would be Steens Mountains. I don't know if anybody been there. Which one? Steens. Steens. S-T-E-E-N-S. Steens Mountains. Uh, you go down to almost, I think it's passing in Burns, Oregon. Where were the last stick up with the those farm guys that try to take on a oh, yeah. federal <laughs> building of some sort? <laughs> Bun, um, Bundy, yeah. Yeah. Bundy family. Yeah. So um, the case was dismissed, by the way, by the judge. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't right. So, um, anyways, uh, so Steens Mountains down there, you get up to almost 10,000 feet elevation on your car, and you can drive that with a regular sedan, but you're on a gravel road. Um, you can see snow as early as probably end of August, beginning of September, and you can see the road snowed in probably till probably mid June. So just you, you got summertime basically to hit it. 
it's beautiful. On the other side of Steens, you have Alvard Desert. Um, I think it's like a 40 by 60 mile stretch. And it's actually like the place where the cracked earth kind of look to it. And you can speed, you can set your own speed record there even because you can drive <laughs> as fast as you want. <laughs> I believe there was an official world record set by Wood back in the 70s or 60s on Alvard Desert. And from what I heard, Alvard Desert is, is a number two best spot to take night photography because there's no uh, light pollution. Mm -hmm. So number one is Death Valley. Death so. Valley's bright up there. Yeah. Yeah. Ve <laughs> Vegas lights up the whole valley. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, another one, uh, Hell's Canyon to consider. <coughs> Anybody been up that way? Okay, so you go towards um, 84, towards kind of Idaho border, Washington border corner there. There is called Hell's Canyon, a uh, city called Joseph. So just like Steens, Hell's Canyon, probably any of remote trips like that that you do, I would always suggest carrying at least two jerry cans and just <laughs> fill up at the very last gas station that you can. You gotta, you know, do your planning ahead of the time. Um, on Steens Mountain, yeah, the fuel is like, last time we were there, was it like almost five bucks a gallon? They have a very good burger place at the last city that you hit before you get in the loop. There's a burger joint, I highly advise, make sure it's great. Uh, fill up gas there if you if you haven't brought anything with you. But usually what I would do is like at Burns, like the last bigger city, you top off, and then you top off there just a couple gallons. But you already carry your jerry cans with you. Um, I mean, if you want to carry four jerry cans, depending on how gu how gas guzzler you are. Uh, but two jerry cans I found to be average enough for pretty much most of the trips that I've done. Uh, Hell's Canyon, you get into this area up to the Lookout Tower from there. There's a place called Lord's Flat. It's like almost a dead end spot of the whole trail. It's not open year round. It's snowed in in the winter, obviously. Uh, but they open it up and they close it. Was it end of September? For hunting season. End of September, I think. Whenever yeah, they the close hunting, hunting season it's a 14 mile, really kind of up and up and downhill. And again, you can do it on a stock road for the train tires, no problems at all. Uh, just take it easy. But you can get there. 14 miles took us. Six hours, seven hours. Yeah, it's, it's a slow going trail. Very slow, yeah. It's ruggedy kind of, but it's not like boulders or anything. It's very, very scenic. Um, highly advise anybody to see it. Not, you know, go, to go see it. From there, you can drop down. You can go to what's called Dug Bar Point. It's on the Snake River. So basically, you'll come down from Hell's Canyon area, from the Lord's Flat. You come down back to the Lost City, which was not Joseph, I don't think. It was, it was some other thing that left up my head. But you come down to that city, then you can go back to the uh, Snake River. Yeah, fuel. If you have fuel, fuel tanks, two jerry cans that will last you through the whole way. Come back, and then go to the and then come back out to, to the uh, It gets very hot. One thing you find, like Steens and Hell's Canyon for snakes, they don't suggest hiking during the day with snakes themselves. If you're hiking out in the morning, you probably won't go back until it's dark. The snakes will be along the trail, and it's kind of, I heard it's kind of gets dangerous out that way. Lots of black widows. Lots of what? Black widows. Yeah, black <clears throat> widows out there. I mean, they're not like everywhere, everywhere, but if you go into some dark spot somewhere, you know, like abandoned barn or something, there's something to keep my uh, keep an eye out on, definitely. Uh, <laughs> let's jump on. that do 101 101 is excellent um, do crater lake area I mean basically just jump to crater lake area and you can wheel around um, you can google list of lookout towers it's great great I mean if you want to get a scenic drive lookout towers is you know your top choice probably you, some of you have to hike to some of you can actually drive up to a lot of them offer uh, actual campsites right on top they're open and some, some, or for the most part, they'll have a host there as well. And they're pretty friendly. I've become friends with a few of them. Um, pretty cool guys over there. And I mean, usually you get the sunrise, sunset, just the best over there. So, um, by Crater Lake, by Diamond Lake, right? I think the Cinnamon Butte? Yeah. Cinnamon Butte. Just, I, I'm, my pronunciation cinnamon is better. Yeah. Cin cinnamon, like the cinnamon rolls. The cinnamon yeah. There's a tower there. I know the guy who's been there the past probably five years on the tower. Real, real nice guy uh, and there's an actual spot you can see but the sunset the way I guess the the wind blows clouds from the uh, ocean you can see the 
different layers of oranges. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only spots that I found that to be. And he said it's the way the canyon over there works over the, there's a Klamath River kind of that area. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's the ridges there that kind of cover and block certain waves of uh, airflow that come through that make that the view in there. That's quite good. So um, we did recently, what, middle of March, month ago? Yeah, month ago. We did uh, Canada, BC. Beautiful. Beautiful Canada, BC. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's great. Um, if you want to go further out, I suggest doing Colorado. That's a, a week to 10 day trip at least. So if you're doing anything over 1,500 miles or anything over 1,000 miles one way, I highly suggest to just plan at least a seven to 10 days. Because you, you're gonna be you're gonna be talking at least probably four days. High elevation, I heard it buzzes you twice as much. Keep that in mind. <laughs> I tried that and it didn't work on me. My head. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good. But yeah, scenery is there, and then they have like States Mountains because you're in the high alpine area. The snow is gonna melt slower and it's gonna come in sooner. Be careful there. Um, I don't advise going by yourself if you're new. Just always, I mean. Bring another new buddy at least with you, <laughs> so at least you, you know, you know, the if, if you're short fused and you're like, I should not gonna go, they're gonna at least try to stop you, maybe, you know, kind of like that, so. Uh, let's see, the question I guess would be, uh, when to use certain features? So Andrew Taylor from uh, PDX Overlanders, he said, my FG Cruiser has 4x4, high versus low, diff lock, A-track, and crawl control. I'm not sure when I need to enable that. Uh, I've done a few light trails, uh, like Light D, for example, but I want to try some bigger stuff and some sand riding. Sand has been a common question, but I guess we live by sand dunes, so that's kind of a normal thing. So uh, let's go into technicalities, I guess, of 4x4. Four four. So uh, I suggest watching some YouTube videos on actual different, like, they have like schematics of how 4x4 four four works. You have to understand the fact that even when you're in a four wheel drive, I believe in the most vehicles, you're technically only turning one wheel out of all four. So the engine in the transfer case is all gonna, always going to pass the torque and the power to the tire that has least rolling resistance. So the, whatever the tire has more stress on it, so uh, it, it will stop turning and the tire that has less traction will start turning. So if you ever gotten kind of stuck, you'll see the one tire spins and the other just sits there and you're like, well, I thought I was in four wheel drive. Just what, like two weeks ago, went up to snow families. My buddy was on his Tundra TRD something package, like a real nice one, no rear locker. And he got stuck in his head. I'm like, my four wheel drive. I'm like, what do you mean? Only rear tire. But he was flexed out and he buried himself. So only one tire was getting kind of a traction. It was, and the front was barely catching on from time to time. He couldn't even tell it was on. So that's, that's where you have to understand that four wheel drive, when it's on, the wheels are equally kind of receiving the, the power from the drivetrain, but your front end catches, I think it's like 30%. I mean, on average, I mean, vehicle to vehicle is going to be different, but it's going to be 30% to the front and 70 to the rear because most cars are rear-wheel drive in the 4x4 world, right? So the, the rear is getting more power because it's, it has the stronger axle in the back, whatnot. So uh, unless you have a locker, which is diff lock, differential locker in actual axle, you're not going to be able to get the two wheels turning in any one axle. Now, if you have front and rear locker, that's where you're going to be able to engage actually all four wheels. That's why a lot of guys like, well, well, do I build it to be locked or do I buy it locked? Simplest example is like Rubicon Wrangler, for example. I think that's the only one that I know right now, at least in a new production, that comes out fully locked from factory as far as front and rear, where you can just activate the lockers and you actually have the true four-wheel drive system on all the time. So unless you actually built it, so you put in an, a locker in into the front or rear, you're never going to have the true four-wheel drive capability. There's a difference between all-wheel drive, how things get passed on, and versus like uh, four by forces. And they're a little bit different because in the all-wheel drive, if I remember correct, you get more power to the front always and the rear kind of as a backup. Uh, but then all-wheel drive vehicles would usually have what's called center differential lock. So the actual transfer case where you do the shifting four wheel drive uh, for low, for high, neutral, whatever, that's where you have also diff lock in the center differential lock. So it'll lock the transfer case. So it'll always keep the front one, the front tires, one, the rear tires always locked. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So because that's, that's how it works. So basically, don't consider yourself in a four wheel drive vehicle totally four wheel drive because always 
is going to be like okay so which wheel is going to take the more impact of traction to keep the keep you going uh and then the case where you're on a hard pack <coughs> so like we're talking about off-road in the hard not in like icy conditions i'm talking about or paved road with the you know after rain or whatever but we're talking about like this kind of stuff whatever keeping all four wheels down the ground that's what's going to give you the most traction are we getting chilly no yeah yeah if you guys want to do a walk around we can do like a walk around about some rig and kind of whatnot so i mean it's fine um so that's something to keep in mind as far as four wheel drive versus like all wheel drive versus truly locked unlocked uh but keep in mind that once you if you're locked fully and you get stuck that's when you really get stuck so one guy told me one time older gentleman when i was first like back in the years, i'm like so what's the four wheel drive for and for a little four he goes, well, you're always driving a rear-wheel drive. When you get stuck, he goes, you put in four-wheel drive. And that's when you back out and just go home. <laughs> so that's something to keep consider and keep in mind that you can truly get yourself, you know, into trouble because you're thinking a four four high, you, you, you're making it. Uh, but for the most part, this four-low is going to get you out if you got stuck in a four high or no two high, just four high. But it's going to be probably tougher to get you out of so four-wheel drive lock you know, spinning all tires i mean there's no way of getting out there getting yanked from somebody or getting winched out so. uh, upgrades lifts so lifts will be really depending on the fact of what tire size you want to run so that's really about what kind of tire size you want to stuff in there in your wheel wheels some guys like to have a uh, lower center uh, low center of gravity so they're going to put a bigger tire on with a little lift so they're going to cut the arches out as much or you have less up travel and more down travel for in the suspension and that's all getting into like the custom building of suspensions and whatnot. i don't know if it's worth going into those technicalities or not, but something to keep in mind so um get jerry cans fuel range if you want to get bigger fuel range and not carry jerry cans or just carry one jerry can uh there are aftermarket fuel tanks you can add on so either you basically take the factory fuel tank out and put a bigger volume on it uh, and you can get some that have factory 18 and you you can fit another like a 20 gallon in there so, I mean, you'll get a pretty good range overall um, tips and safety about night runs never done those and don't have much of experience in aftermarket lights and i'm wondering if it's safe for me to go on a night run well if you have headlights i guess you're good <laughs> yeah, for the most part um, light bars well they're illegal on freeways or highways technically so basically they're considering your off-roading lights. I heard some states now require you to cover your lights when you're on a not an off-road situation. Um, in some cases, I heard in some states that if you don't have them covered, the cop might pull you over and actually give you a set of uh, cutters to make you cut the wire. So, well, it's illegal. So <laughs> if you don't have the covered, you got to cut it. Uh, otherwise, you get a ticket or whatnot. So, um, so night runs, um, we've done night wheeling around kind of a little bit. Um, any extra light you have will help you. Do you need rock lights? If you want to see under the car what's going on, for repairs especially, yeah. And that would be a good idea. I have a set that's laying around I need to put on kind of for the for the looks and functionality, but I don't think it, anything really required other than just paying attention. I mean, in a, in a night you have to understand that you don't see everything because you see everything. I mean, there's not much, not much to it. Um, just take it easy. Um, just go with the flow and don't always, you know, try to, don't be the guy that, you know, or the gal that says, well, well, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> right. I mean, just keep in mind, you, in the overlanding world, you, you drive to and home, and then you drive daily on your rig most likely. So you want to take care of it. Dunes, so dunes, snow. Um, I'm not going to touch gravel on it, but mud probably similar to it. Uh, I'll touch up on the subject of uh, deflation. So how much you airing down do you want to do? Um, ideally for dunes or snow, you want to see a little, it's called ballooning effect on the tires. So when you air down and your tires start kind of squishing on the side, that's when you want to kind of consider it probably good enough for you. Every tire is different, every vehicle is different, weight wise. Um, how tires are different, there's uh, fly ratings. So I don't know if anybody familiar with, so there's uh, C rated tires, there's D rated, E rated. E rated are mostly for heavy duty trucks, so they're made to be aired up to 80 psi. So when you haul heavy loads or uh, hauling a trailer or whatever, so you get 80 psi on the highway. But normally, those tires usually 
I think you run like daily, you'd run with like 45, 50, maybe even 35 PSI. That's sufficient if you're not loading it up. Uh, but those tires have stiffer, thicker sidewall. So for them to air down, they're not gonna balloon as much. They're probably gonna just hold, hold, hold. And when you drop down to like five PSI, they're gonna just gonna go like this. They're gonna <laughs> squint out to the side. Um, so the lesser your air down, the more of that ballooning effect. Keep in mind you have more rolling resistance on your tires. So you're gonna almost feel like the, the tires, the, the car doesn't wanna go. If you put it in neutral or you put it in drive, it might not even roll by on its own because it's so, so much rolling resistance, right? I found that with these tires that I have, they're D-rated. Uh, before I run always C-rated. So when I drop down to like five PSI, they don't really balloon, they kind of like squish almost. And then for a low when I'm driving and I'm geared and all that to compensate for the tire size, uh, the rig still just kind of feels like it's under tension to, you know, trying to, because it's trying to turn all that rubber. You know, it's a lot of rubber to work with. Um, ideally, probably, I mean, you want to drop down to 20 PSI, anything that's off-road. I, mean, I don't think you're going to run the initial uh, breaking the bead. Breaking the bead, 5 PSI. <laughs> It all depends on your circumstances. So 5 PSI, if you're going to go to 5 PSI, you have to keep in mind, you're always going to, you want to keep it straight. So any off camber situation, you're basically pulling the bead off. How the wheel is made from inside, if you ever looked into bead locks, a lot of uh, manufacturers, they make only the front bead lock. They're not bead lock from both sides. The way that, so I'm going to try to do my best drawing it up. So how the rim is here, so right, and we're going inside. So this one has, the dip for the tire bead mm -hmm. and then it has this lip like this and it, and it drops down to, into the tire while this one has a slower and doesn't have that little ridge okay. it's so that when they mount it it's easier to put it on so the inner bead usually has a harder time breaking off because it has that extra ridge on it so most of the bead like wheels you, you find on, in the market that's for sale they're gonna have just the outer bead lock on it uh, for example the ones I have Hutchinson's they're called true bead locks so there's a two-piece wheel. When you put it together, there's an inner rubber ring that goes inside, so it actually locks the beads no matter what happens. So basically, you can drop it down to no air, run it off camber, hang it on the side, whatever. It will never pop off the bead. Um, they're originally were made, I believe, for military use, and then they made like a civilian version of it for Jeeps and whatnot. Uh, but you can find them for Toyotas, Jeeps, Land Rovers, anything. Hutchinson makes them. They run about 400 bucks a week. And it's a good investment if you are considering something that you're going to be doing more technical stuff like you know, airing down, still going to go, but you're going to have a hard time. Four low is obviously a good idea, but if you're in a four high and you're keeping the momentum going, you should be fine. Um, airing down, probably 20, 15 PSI should be sufficient enough for the most rigs. Um, and again, and then again, it's you know how heavily you're loaded. The heavier you're loaded, the higher PSI is going to give you more ballooning, obviously. And if you're light, the more you turn down more to get more Gets ballooning effect on the tires. Um, all terrain <coughs> tires probably do just as good in sand as mud terrain, but mud terrains will give you more grip if you're spinning the tire quite a bit more. But the heavier you're on the gas pedal, the faster you're going to dig yourself in, <laughs> the more trouble you're going to get yourself in. Um, so basically, if you're, getting, if you're getting stuck and if you have any, you know, uh, kind of like you, you know you're not going anywhere, you know your tires are spinning, stop. Don't try to get yourself more you know, deeper dug in. Kind of estimate the situation. I don't know. If you smoke, take a cigarette break. If you like coffee, take <laughs> a coffee break. You know, whatever. You know, a lot of times the drill line rush is gonna overwhelm you a little bit, so you're gonna make some decision you're gonna regret making. Yep. So uh, I've had a situation uh, a few years back. One of my first snowcats were going up in the hills here. I end up sinking into a like a side of the lake. Um, we were driving through, and the way the snow layered, there was more water than expected summer there was no water there so i end up actually breaking this through the ice and dropping the snow cat into the halfway into the water kind of thing oh, yeah. so adrenaline kicked in we were like oh we're sinking my buddy says he remembers me standing in the water trying to pull it up <laughs> all right it's impossible but i mean i was wet i was like that wet i mean there was probably about that much water sitting on the side with all the layers of the rain water and the ice pack whatnot uh, but simple fact just we put the winch line out and i tried to kind of speed it up, the tracks broke through more ice, and the whole thing just went on going in the water. Now, if I would have kind of, you know, gotten out and estimated the fact that, well, there's no way I'm getting out of this without having any other, other <laughs> help from any other vehicle or whatnot, we probably would have hiked out dry, brought my Jeep the same night, and probably just, you know, pulled myself out and would have been just fine. No, I ended up actually sinking the whole thing in right. and having 
my Jeep and another Jeep come out two inches and getting it out of the water. So, yeah, take a break. Let that adrenaline settle in. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're going to about to roll, do get out and kind of see. I mean, if you if you get in a situation where you're thinking you're going to roll, don't move. Estimate your weight, who's sitting where. So if you, for example, if you're going this way and you got a bunch of passengers here, if they get out, your weight, you know, going to counterbalance. So you may you might want to have them get out and open up these these doors and kind of hang on them or something, right? Um, but do know your cap cap capabilities of vehicles. We've done a couple of times with my buddies where I've hooked a strap on one side and probably put a winch line to that side and actually put my rig as much as I can off camber before it starts tipping. Mm -hmm. Just kind of because your pucker factor gets before <laughs> the actual vehicle <laughs> will. <laughs> and, you know, so you, you, you need to know where your comfort level is. Because some guys are like, well, I'll just throttle through this. And sometimes you can't. And then, you know, case by case, you, you might be able to get away with it. But a lot of times, it's like, yeah, no, you can't go. Uh, we've had, uh, was it June, around the lolly? In the snow, keep in mind, spring, summer snow, a lot of underwater creeks. I was driving, we were driving, and everything was fine. And my front right tire just drops. And it's hanging two feet in the air, and an axle just hanging on the snow. My rear tire on the other side is like two feet off the ground jeeps like like this and i'm like okay <laughs> so what do you do in a situation like that you know so this is where you like literally just kind of stop and estimate you know what do you want to do for as far as what's what's your next step do you want to winch do you want to recover as far as shovel out do you want to secure yourself first and then do a little more winching so case by case just be careful use some common sense and if you're gonna try the extreme stuff just kind of Every time you get behind the wheel, do understand the fact that you're probably going to roll one day. Oh, no. I mean, it's like, you're probably going to, I mean, you, you just have to kind of keep that. I mean, hopefully you don't, right. but you just have to, it's like, in the in the drone world, they say, you know, when you first buy a drone, you first fly it, just understand the fact that one time you're going to drop it. Right. It's just, it's going to happen. You know, you're going to crash it, it's going to break, nothing's going to happen to you, you're just going to probably buy another one, possibly, or not. <laughs> but in any case, you just have to kind of go with that, so... Uh, in my experience, I've rolled my Jeeps twice, and I'm still wheeling. So it, it's not going to make you go away from it. Uh, but it's like I said, it's all about the journey. So I'm more like a photographer with Vlad. I like photography quite a bit. So my main thing has always been just how to get there and why I'm going there. Uh, if you're just wheeling about, um, it's really becomes boring. See like what, what you're able to do, whatever. A lot of times, make, make the day make the day more fun by actually selecting maybe some kind of location where you can get to. You can kind of study up on the road. I mean, if you're going to be taking just a route up to some lookout tower, there's a good chance that the gravel roads on the forest service roads are going to be just fine. You're going to make it. You're not going to have any issues. And then uh, you know, take some side roads. You know, you're going to find maybe some tree fall, and there's perfect opportunity for you to try an axe out and see how the winching works on the tree. But all, all along, just mind how things operate, how winch lines can snap, how hooks can break, how you know, straps can break, and how things can fly into your windshield and damage you or damage somebody else, and practice the safety. I mean, can you be over safe? Probably not. But sometimes when things are got to be moving along fast, because certain recovery does take a rather shorter time than longer time, you probably want to kind of be on the, on the go faster than just kind of taking it whole secret pack break. <laughs> so CB adequate and usage. I'll touch up on that side. Head CBs and fuel my rigs. Uh, rarely use them. They're very useful in the groups. So if you're in a group, I think almost like more than here, maybe less windy. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, CBs are good for communication, short range obviously. So like if you were going in a group like this and we were actually traveling in a group to a certain destination, they're good to, to keep to keep going, but if you don't have a CB in the group, is pretty common. <coughs> it's not necessarily everybody expert, but the basic like what I was saying when we were leaving here is, if you travel in the group, if you're the last person, the person before you should keep an eye out for you. So if you slow down, they'll slow down, and then vice versa, and you're all the way out to the person. So as I'm riding, I'm looking always to the guy behind me. If I see him, then I'm guessing he's seeing the guy behind him. But it's a good practice to look two cars behind, so this way, in case somebody forgets or whatever. Um, in the group, usually the, the leader is the person that knows where you're going. And 
you told the same Sean are the slowest people, you want to put the fastest people in the back. Because then <laughs> they can't really make the break up. Whatever. Uh, it just, it's, it's the most common thing. And if the group gets too big, just take another leader. Split into As long as they know where they're going. And you the group and let, let everybody have fun. Because uh, if you're in a snow run like we were doing in February, uh, we had what about 15 rigs roughly. I mean, we broke up the group into two because it took us three hours to get through two miles. Um, everybody kept just getting sunk, sunk in. I mean, it's all obviously you not know, inexperienced snow wheelers per se. But when you're starting, you're like, okay, well, we're not gonna make it home by by dark, obviously. <laughs> and if you're driving five miles an hour and you have to slow down because you can't see the road anymore because so much wind, snow blowing, you know and uh, apparently, when we were leaving on Sunday morning, we left Alali after the camp. 12:30, we, we lined up. One, we left. Um, I was told 10:30 there was a guy in a Suzuki. They camped towards that side. I don't know if you ever saw him or not. There was another guy in a Jeep on a 37s and a Suzuki, a little bit built. Uh, they left at 10:30 that morning, and we were going at one o'clock. We couldn't see their trail. So he, he said that wow. they were breaking trail already. So they went through, and then when we got to power lines, anybody who's been up to Alali here, power lines, I was pushing snow hood high, and I, so I mean, I, I literally was just kind of like, are we going to make it tonight home? So it was, it was like, a, basically plan ahead. Big thing, weather. I mean, always mind the weather. I mean, if it's summertime, you're going to get hit with rain, yeah, you got to the worst case scenario. Keep in mind that, you know, Heavy rain gonna be black slides or something. Falls. But if you're in the snow, especially being that I'm more in the snow stuff, I guess um, always know when the storms come in. And if you have any reason to believe the storm is coming, make it you're there. Make sure you know you're gonna be able to not just make it in there, but make it out as well. Because it's a lot of times it's like, I mean, snowed in. I never really had that with me happen before. I have heard the guys like, oh, I got snowed in. And I'm like, how do you get snowed in? <laughs> and then this time when we were leaving, I'm like, okay. So I was towing a stock Tacoma behind me in a strap. Yeah. Pretty much, what, half of the way at least. Um, he was carrying some of my gear, so I kind of had to. <laughs> but I told him, I said, well, I'm at like, uh, so I started at 5 PSI, and I had to drop down to 1.5 PSI my tires wow. to be able to break trail. I wasn't able to get good traction until I dropped down to that low. Wow. So the snow was really dry. It was still probably 30, 28 degrees outside. Yeah. Uh, snow levels were, I think, about 2,000 feet that day. So, I mean, we had that dry snow, but it was packing a little bit, but it was kind of dry. I and mean, flakes were, like, that huge. I mean, it would, wow. it would drop two, three inches in a matter of just minutes. Right. I mean, it was just, just crazy. Uh, but just you have to understand the fact that it's, like, I was just like, okay, well, I can make it out, but then I'm going to have to probably go back and forth, break trail, and pull one by one out. So how do you do that? You know, it's like, how does that work? <laughs> I'm all out on, running out on fuel already. So... Let's drop down to a little more stuff. Any questions? If you don't have, if you're not using a CV, what do you recommend? Uh, I don't use anything, period, oh, as really? far as for communications, because whenever I go, it's like two guys behind me and they know where we're going. I said, just stay with me. If I don't see you, I'll stop. Uh, I mean, there's really, if you're on a long trip, it's nice to have a communication, but that's when you, I, I suggest handheld CVs. It's easy to take it out and uh, walk around. Otherwise, a lot of times when you're doing something and they're trying to talk to you, but the CDs in the car, you can't hear them anyways. Right. So uh, Cobra has a handheld and the unit actually unplugs and plugs into like a plug-in. Um, another one, you know, put one in. Uh, one thing that I do carry now, just recently I acquired, I got two handheld ham radios, uh, but I programmed through the FRS channels like a walkie-talkie. So they're basically like walkie-talkies, but a little bit stronger. So usually I'll give the second one to like, Today we're running the group. I mean, I don't know who has what, you know. So for me, it's like having CVs. Like, who's got CV? Most people don't. Right. I mean, most people. Who has ham? You know, only one guy, maybe out of the group, will. So I mean, you'll put that guy probably in the back. But in most cases, I just give my second hand help to whoever's going to be the last, so he can kind of keep me in touch as far as what's going on with the group. If I don't see somebody or whatnot, uh, that's the best way. I mean, communication is really. If you're going solo, who cares? Right. And really, if your cell phone don't work, you're. CB probably not going to get you any help anyways. I mean, you can sit there on Channel 9 or whatever it is, asking for help all day long, and nobody's right. probably going to hear you. Uh, if you are a ham operator, you can talk to anybody all the way across the world pretty much, but you got to really know what you're doing with it. 
and you gotta have the license for it and go through the class. But right. I mean, it does help. Though. So if you know you're gonna be getting yourself into trouble, maybe, or you have any reason to believe your vehicle's not, you have to figure out what you wanna use for communications. So right. One thing, if you go in a lot of solo, and it's kind of like on the extreme level where you have any fear of you know, being somewhere out on your own, broken down, whatever, I suggest getting a spot on those GPS trackers. You can press a button and get a you know, search and rescue come out to help you. Uh, there's different ones, he and I were talking about it earlier. Um, I heard that spot is not very precise, but they're probably one of the original ones that were uh, marketed for public use, so, so to say. They usually devices like that, they have three buttons. You program the two for whatever you want the commands to be, and the third one is the SOS button, the one that gets, uh, is it? Search, uh, and, rescue. search and rescue, we'll county, police, we'll state police, you, yeah. right? They right. get yeah. they get that. Uh, first two buttons, usually people program like, the buddy that I have with one, he says basically his program, so he texts and emails whoever you wanted to text. It's like up to five or ten addresses you can choose. Yeah. So it'll text on the first button. He programs like I'm okay heading home. Yep. The second one's like I'm having a little issues. I'll be late. Like don't worry about me kind of thing. Yep. And the third one is the SOS button basically. Right. But that's when search and rescue or whoever. Yeah. She might come in on that. So. Yeah. All right. It's yeah. called. Spot. You might see her. <laughs> yeah. If I get up here, my wife wants to know where I'm at. I want to push the button. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it, it helps. Uh, services were like 100 bucks a year, I think. Um, yeah, I think it was like 129 when we renewed ours, and then I think that they're doing a new system where they can do it per use. Per use. So you register it, but I don't know what that cost is, and I don't yeah. know if that's been implemented. Yeah, it all depends how much how much you want to use it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not something you know, research what device works best. Uh, on the recent trip, I took a guy with me up to Alala here. He had one. I can't remember what it was the brand, but he said in their group, he does more extreme like snowmobiling and stuff, like Baker and Old right. Moms whatnot. And they had a guy with a spot, and they were a mile off wow. um, looking for him. Wow. The one that he had, he said it's precise basically to like five feet. Is that an inReach? Garmin inReach? Uh, I don't think it was Garmin. Okay. It was some got, other one. They've got the inReach, which you can text back and forth, and it will get you connected as well with your GPS coordinates then you can it goes by satellite and then Garmin has well, combined with them as well <laughs> yeah and they're pretty accurate yeah mm -hmm. so he, he 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 got that one and uh but he's he carries a set phone with him too kind of thing so yeah. it, you know it's basically like that depends on what kind of, kind of trouble you're looking to get yourself into. <laughs> <laughs> no trouble <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean it's almost like I don't know business idea I've been always thinking about different ideas like man somebody should just create one for like renting such tools mm -hmm. you uh -huh. know like yeah Right. She's like, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it would be nice. I mean, just if you go case by case, you know, I mean, you're paying whatever and, you know, you want to take it for a month, you just figure out what kind of cost. Like, I don't need it, right. but I'll take it for a couple of trips, for example, you know, or something. Uh, but I think I should, I'm probably the type that should just carry it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really it's really how you want to be, re you know, recovering yourself, making, making sure you can, you can make your way out. Uh, I've had cases where we broke track on a snow cat. Then I sank the cat. I rolled the jeep. Oh, uh, so at least three times that I can recollect off my top of my head, real fast, were uh, what ten mile hikes. You talk about rain, snow, blizzardy conditions. Um, as I mentioned to him, the the shortest road is the one you know. Right. So if you know, and then again, be prepared with the gear. I mean, if you're going out in your jeans and your sneakers into the snowstorm, mm -hmm. and you know your rig is capable, you, you know luck. what your shoes are not. Right. And you're gonna freeze to death, and you're gonna be the one, you know, another guy to cause another closure on the road, basically. So that's one of the main reasons why I was like, you know, it's time maybe just kind of giving back to the community off, or is like telling people, like, because I'm coming across, you know, Eric was mentioning well, two weeks ago you guys were out here. Was that uh, two weeks? Lady uh, on the camera? Something like that. Like uh, four weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, we came from the Detroit side, <coughs> and there was. One lane groove on the main road, probably, I don't know, knee deep snow on the sides. And the first vehicle that we came across was like a little gray CrossFit thing or something with highway tire who came up from Estacada. And he was just stuck in the middle of the road. And so we got him chained up and turned around. And then uh, the next vehicle was a Audi TT with That's Cali amazing. California plates. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> and Crazy. The, kid was wearing, the kid was 
was real nice, but he was wearing uh, shorts <laughs> and a t-shirt and some um, black leather men's dress shoes oh, wow. without socks. Oh, man. So, yeah. And then later, we <coughs> came across uh, Toyota Camry with uh, an older woman that had been sitting there waiting for someone for a day and a half. Oh, oh my gosh. God. Lucky. Really? Yeah. So you never know who you come across. So, I mean, it's, sometimes it amazes you who comes out and what they try to look for. Uh, but I mean, it's, after all, I mean, it is, you know, if you're looking for adventure, you're going to easily find it. You're going to be looking for it. So, yeah. but just have a backup plan for yourself if you're going out, you know, be, be careful. So, I have some more notes um, to go through. I figured we'd maybe take a quick break. And uh, I'll do another maybe hour of talking or so, and then answer some questions. And then I, I would like to do maybe walk around any of the rigs, kind of just s explain how suspension things are, and you know how the lockers work, whatnot. Then we can break for lunch. And if we want to talk more, we can talk more. And then if not, uh, we can do the driving course. And anybody want to try a certain path and that they're kind of in fear of before we can break <laughs> that fear. <laughs> so. And then just, uh, you know, like a little disclosure for myself personally, everything that I'm saying is based on my experience. It's not based on any one certain specific fact, but other than my personal experience. So do exercise your own common sense as far as what works for you. I mean, for you might work where you like to see only two inches. For some it's uh, For some it's mud or rock. Staying on a paved road and camping it. But uh, the whole overlanding word, whatnot, it's gotten so abused lately, I'll say the word. Um, the way I look at it is basically it's like, one example I was talking to one of the guys that was supposed to come out. Uh, I said, so if you buy a snowboard, does that make you a snowboarder? <laughs> so right. if you buy a rooftop tent or you buy a 4x4 vehicle, does that make you <coughs> an overlander? It does not. So and then uh, PDX Overland Group, uh, it's a good group, tight, everybody shares information probably, but uh, a lot of people have commented to me, they're like, ah, the groups that come is so like, off-roading. A lot of people are, they're just showing their Yoda crawlers per se, and, and they're just a Browns camp group, that, that, which found another forum to hang out and kind of come and communicate and talk about. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just, you know, I don't know. I mean, you can be an overlander in a Prius for all I care, I guess. But, I mean, what is, what is, you know, overlanding? Overlanding is travel, traveling over, over the roads, per se actually doing like the expeditionary style trips so if you're glamping as they call it glamour camping out in KOA campground are you really an overlander uh, I don't know as long, I think as long as you're it's like backpacking but your vehicle's your backpack so it's vehicle dependent yeah camp. well vehicle dependent travel yeah. but I mean we're talking about you know not necessarily campgrounds camping right and yeah, so it's just, you know, I overlanded this weekend. The guy sends a picture of the rooftop tent of the camera. I just laugh. I'm just like, yes, buddy. No, I mean, there's, I mean, you can't give a bad rap to anybody. I mean, everybody's pretty uh, good in the group and everybody, I mean, overland, overland group overall. Um, a lot of people just want to learn, I think. That's, that's what it's come down to because a lot of people want to get out and kind of explore because we are in this new, probably, dawn of air or whatever era like of exploration and, and uh, I'm betting that there's eventually they're gonna be changing some laws as far as you know travel management and all that a lot more people are getting out uh, a lot of people are messing around they're not being very respectful of nature and whatnot mm -hmm. so um, just you know practice the concept of you know pack it in pack it out and bring sure. it back, you know live it better than you find it kind of thing um, and at times you can't control the situation, you're gonna make a mess, but you can always come back and clean up after yourself, that's the thing. So I know one thing for like winter camp that we do, um, I try to come back there as soon as the snow starts melting off, because you're gonna come back there, wind blows, snow covers, things are you know, blown away. Wow! There you go. <laughs> Is that a can or what? <laughs> well, a propane tank. Oh. Or some. <laughs> so yeah, um, just, you know, mind, mind, mind. Uh, Wake up call. Yeah. What, what's going to be happening no down the road, you know, what, what our kids are going to see and what the kids of the kids are going to see. Mm -hmm. so. All right. 
Let's take a break. I gotta let my uh, So which one are you? Is it X or Nix? <laughs> Whatever. So uh, uh, on on my YouTube channel, all this stuff I'm gonna post there, so you can review back if you want to. So I'm gonna just kind of like whatever gear one by one and we'll go over that I guess so one thing I suggest I carry I like to have them some nuts some hazelnuts some walnuts they're a good source of protein and energy or whatever and whenever you sit in the fire and I mean, if you don't have anything to eat I mean they can run around your rig I've had these probably for you no know, I substitute them because I eat them so I mean some of them probably been run some of them have probably been running around for probably a year or two in the back now but in any case so batteries right it's growing we're good so batteries um under the hood your most common factory battery will be just starting battery right so familiar with deep cycle batteries right so deep cycle batteries are like the rv style battery for example the one that has higher what's called amp hour rating amp hour rating basically going to give you more juice lengthwise so it's going to be just as strong as your regular battery probably but it'll have more torque if you look at it like horsepower versus torque so basically it'll last you as good but longer and deep cycle batteries they they're uh, they can handle more of a deeper discharge um, yellow tops optima yellow top they're deep cycle battery but lately i've heard smack about them as i guess they taken the production over to mexico and my last ones that i've used on my lexus i had a dual battery setup they've gave up actually at the same time too. So, um, do I advise them? I don't know. Try them. They cost as much. But recently I've tried the X2. I'll open up my hood and I'll show. So, uh, up to my yellow tops, they run, I believe, 55 amp hours each. And I was able to find the, the blue, it's a blue one. I think it's Energizer X2. And if I remember correct, the rating on that is 105 amp hours. So, yes, you're running on only one battery. So, if one battery gives you crap, then you're stuck, kind of, yeah. Uh, in my case, I carry one of these guys. I bought it at Fry's Electronics. Battery starters. You can recharge your cell phone or whatever. Um, you just charge up at home, take it with you. I have had helped others jump starting it. So this is what happens. So I guess there's some kind of a, like a relay fuse or something diode pack in here that it kind of start melting up on me. And I was only starting a, a, a V6 engine on it. But these are supposed to handle even a diesel engine start. So I'm not sure if I did something wrong or just device itself is kind of not able to handle what they're saying it's supposed to handle. But I found it basically it's a good as a backup. I mean it should get you going, I'm assuming. But like I said, as far as reliability wise, you want to look at whatever device maybe people want to review saves better or whatnot. Carry a tarp if you can. Doesn't take up much space, doesn't have doesn't weigh much. One other thing, duct tape. We know we can get to the moon with it, right? Right. So it's, it's helpful no matter what. Uh, extinguishers, it's good to have, especially if you're running in dry conditions, fires, campfire, putting it out if something gets out of hand. Um, do check it from time to time and have it inspected and make sure it's working. Carry one, it's like a concealed carry licensing class. They said, what, you know, what kind of gun should you carry? Well, you carry as big as you can. So with fire, I've taken classes for uh, fire departments basically the biggest problem most people found is that you run out of them faster than you expect so it'll run out by the time you actually put out a fire probably depending on how big the fire is obviously but having something at least will give you a hint i mean if your engine's on fire full-blown fire i don't think much is going to help you there <laughs> unless you have a fire truck next to you so, <coughs> so repellent very good um any brand specific i don't know i've used this one rei any sporting store uh, any gear you can spray with it, spray it. It doesn't matter. I've done my shoes, I've done my pants, any clothing, totally, you can spray it. But it's, I believe it, they want you to have it like 24 hour dry time. Then you can reapply it. Because if you just apply it, it won't be really as good as it stays dry on for, for a day or whatever it is. Um, fridge, they come in all sorts of sizes and shapes, all sorts of brands. I've always been happy with the medics. I found them to be the most reasonably priced and they're on the uh, compressors so there's two kinds of the fridges how they run so some put out more cooling but they eat up your battery pretty fast this one i have found to be very efficient it's a 19 quart i think um, 
you could put quite a few things in there. I also have a 35 quart. I've tried 45, I tried 55, and I had a 70. Um, Home Depot sold the one that we use for Colorado. It was a Home Depot unit. It had a two sections in it, and you can send different temperature ranges in them. So one I ran as a like a freezer, and one as a cooler. But it was a I was gonna say gas guzzler, but it's electrical guzzler. So um, I mean, you really you want to be careful not to drain your battery too much with a big one like that. This one you could probably leave it on if you're running a deep cycle battery, and if it's a like you drive and just running overnight and you drive the next day you're not gonna have to worry about battery dying on you um, even with the 35 quart i found that that one i just have run 24 7. most people would shut them off before they go to bed because you don't keep it open in at night so it's, it'll, it'll retain the coolness in it uh, but keep in mind that freezers or fridges like this your your volume or your capacity is same as most people get them the same as coolers, like the red Coleman's or whatever, those 40 quarts. So you have to keep in mind that half of it usually is ice. So only half of it is actually groceries or foods in there, right? So when you do a 35 quart, you're like, so what do I put in there? Because you already put everything and it's only like halfway full. So the more full it is, the better it, more efficient it is obviously, right? So what I suggest is, what I do is take the bottles like this, fill them up with water. If you were using them, if not, just take them to the freezer day or two before you go on a trip and you just stuff up your fridge with them you have cold water plus it helps you maintain the efficiency of the fridge and keep you know keeping it more full than that these were made in some cases for full-size rigs like sequoias Toyota Land cruisers some land rovers i believe in your case like the 80 series you can use it they take the center console out and you make a little platform and you can put that to be your armrest when you're driving so you're gonna get to your beer no. <laughs> uh, but it's a basically you know and there's a cup holder here too so i think that's kind of the concept how they made it this one ran i want to say around 300 bucks the fridges can go up as high as probably two grand or more depending on what accessories you get with them and if you're talking about like a shelf system with the drawer system hook up those can you know sky's the limit on the pricing there so but they're very useful i highly suggest i have this one i usually get run it as a freezer so i throw ice in there to, for drinks and whatnot, uh, keys ice cream, and then run the 35 quart as a fridge. And keep in mind that anything that's on the bottom gonna cool more versus higher up. So when you pack your groceries, you wanna keep your frozen stuff probably, or do you want the ones you want to keep more frozen on the bottom and going up. Uh, so kind of like layering your clothing, layering your food. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Max tracks. anybody familiar? No, other I'm than curious about those. Yes, a couple of people. Mm -hmm. You can break them. So I'm still waiting for them to get back to me. Maybe they'll get me a new set. I heard that they will actually do that, but I haven't really tried to approach them uh, like 100% with that. Um, it was my fault that they busted, I think, anyways. But um, you can put them over like a pothole or something if you need to drive over, if it's too deep or whatever. It should technically support vehicle's weight, but you want to double it probably just to be sure. Um, I've done single in the Jeep and it has not damaged them, broken. I've tried uh, oh, one of the first Smitty builds when they first came out. On the first trip, I cracked them in the snow. So they were nice enough to take them back and refund me the money. So, uh, but these uh, run about 400 roughly, plus or minus. And they're very good recovery gear. Sand, snow, ice, mud, whatever. Um, the reason they're in a bright color, obviously, is so you can find them later. Uh, I have dug them up in the snow, actually, on the February trip when we were trying to break trail. You guys put them under my rig and by the time i went through they it took them shoveling time i think you were helping right, too yeah. find them. so that's something to keep in mind let me go into compressors so this is my air b a lot smitty built compressors you want to air up or air down whatever so they come on all sizes and capacities abilities you know 12 volt um uh, basically the the bigger the better i guess the faster you get your air supply I and mean, that's pretty much it so this is a single compressor this is a dual with a uh, reservoir tank i've heard guys running uh framing guns off of these even so i mean they, they will do it and it's pretty amazing how fast i think under three minutes i can get the tire full which is pretty much i mean if you're not in a rush you had you have the time when you want to air up and then big tires i mean you're going to take probably 40 minutes to air up while you can just get done in like 15 and go home already. Um, you get the extra holes, whatnot. I always suggest carrying one of these. 
so if you do get a puncture you can repair it on the go uh, very very useful thing um, I've been fortunate enough actually to lend that kit to others rather than using myself so uh, another thing I always say is I'd rather be uh, pulling people a million times out than be pulled out myself or recovered myself so I'd rather help others than be helped uh, as far as deflators whatnot everybody uses different ones most common one I think found is probably this one that pulls the stem out you put it on and you just kind of see how it goes because you pull the stem out let it air out put it in get the reading where you want to be and now keep in mind that these are not as precise as you would want to think they are because they all read differently let me get something else here so cheapo cheapo slime like 2.99 at AutoZone I bought this one it's not very precise so when it shows 12 psi I'm actually at 5 <laughs> and when it shows 24 I'm at 12 so just give you an idea I found this one for 3 bucks at Home Depot electronic I think it's electronic right so psi bar and kpa got all the settings for like european standards or whatever and it's pretty dead on it got a nice little light on but then reliability it's electronic so you know how bad can it go fast battery goes bad or whatever um so i guess if you're using it a lot you know replace the battery and you'll be good um one thing is i don't use these um st type of uh, like the stem puller for airing down what i would usually do is these are available i think at stores but you'll find most tire places use them. They're just basic, you know, you put it in. You just air down like that. Don't lose this either. Yeah. Carry extra with you. When you're done, you just put it in. And while it's airing down, you can already put your gauge up to it without the stem inside. Uh, some people use those to turn on, twist on. They're like 50, 60, 70 bucks. Sets. Put it in set it to 5 PSI. set of gloves leather gloves are better for winching if you especially if you're running a cable like a steel cable on the winch um, I'm running synthetic so this has worked great um, anything that now again if you're getting into wet stuff leather gonna get wet and it's getting icky and it's getting kind of uncomfortable almost so you have to keep that in mind I found these heavy-duty rubberized ones for grizzly grip I found this at a store that sells uh, rigging supplies they were like 15 bucks. So far they're lasting me second season already. No rips, no tears. But again, you know, take care of them, they'll take care of you. And they're warm too. So they're like, I don't know what this stuff is. So. Keep in mind the gear. Recovery. High lift bag. Most of the times, so easiest thing is just to get yourself a uh, set like this. Because then this way they'll, they'll give you what you need basically without having to do the guesswork. Something that's not part of this was that. Um, I think I had a strap in here that I ended up giving to somebody. Uh, but there's two chains in here which can come in handy, believe it or not. And they have a tree saver strap. This one's slowly been modified on my own. There's a hook here too. This is one of the bigger shackles that I put in here just to make sure. So there's, some people call them D-rings and they're actually not D-rings. They're just shackles, I think. D-ring is actually the one that gets welded on in the shape of a D to the bumper and always attached to the bumper. But you know, D-ring, shackle, whatever works. Uh, chain is nice sometimes because you gotta get around. If you're getting somebody out and they have no recovery point, you can get this wrapped around whatever might make sense to wrap around them. Then again, anything and everything has a weak link, so if you're recovering a vehicle that's stuck, really, really stuck, up to, you know, axles deep, whatever, um, in the sand or snow or mud or whatever, well, hopefully not in mud because you're going to get really dirty. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, getting the chain around the stronger part and just kind of using common sense as far as how much force you want to put on when you're recovering it. Uh, tree saver strap, this is the one that came in this kit. It has done the job without any problems. It's starting to turn up, and this is probably, gosh, five, five years old probably kit. But this is the one I bought for a tree saver strap. Um, it has a little more meat to it, I guess you could say. Um, and you know, the wider the strap, the less damage you do to the tree. So just keep that in mind. Straps. 
really however you want to do it this one probably has been f with me ever since I got a first Jeep um, don't tear them up they'll last you a while um, I get I got mine from Harbor Tools they're cheap there 20 30 40 bucks whatever size and you get the bigger rating you know now these are not kinetic straps familiar with kinetic straps or uh, static straps the ones that expand when you pull on mm. So these are actually, you know, they, they, they don't stretch at all. So when you're pulling somebody, you're going to have that impact of the jerk car to car. If you get the kinetic one, they call them bubble ropes or bungee ropes. It's basic concept is the actual, the rope will be whatever rated to the whatever capacity of weight, obviously. So you want to get probably two, three, four times bigger than yours, whatever. Usually they're about that thick and they're round and they're, they interlace with a bunch of rubber strings inside. So the, how the kinetic st strap works is that when you're pulling somebody, it's soft, so you don't really ever feel the jerk on your car or their car. But when you actually feel like you're starting to pull the other person, that's when you want to stop and apply the brakes and let the kinetic energy of the strap, of the rubber, do the pulling out. You'll be amazed how actually easily it does the job because it just and it, rub, and it bounces right back on that car, just jumps right out. So um, these are good to extend your winch line if you need to. Or sometimes you need to secure yourself to whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, the fact, like when your faucet might be rolling over, for example, when you want to make it winch forward, if you want to put a strap to your back, to a tree or something, to secure yourself so you don't roll over. Actually, that's what we did. Tune in anyway. We had a couple of guys set it. Uh, it definitely does the job. Uh, axes. I found this one to be very good for a splitter. You can get this uh, Fiskars in the shorter versions or whatever. It's up to you. And then, and then again, you know, how much wood split do you want to do? Um, I find that small hatchet's always comfortable. You want to have one that's sharp, so to do little branches and you can cut your bread with it. Or if you care, you know, whatever works. Uh, chainsaw, really, which one you want to get? So the longer the blade, obviously, the better job it's going to do as far as the bigger wood. Um, the smaller ones will do the trick. Now keep in mind that when you're cutting the tree down, whichever way it's going to whiplash on you. So if it's just a dead-on laying on the ground, don't get your chainsaw dull if you're going to run into it. Because more or less, if any earth substance, sand or anything touches the blade, it'll dull it pretty quick. And it's like a matter of seconds because you just run it through the rock and it's done. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. We can do a different class on that. <laughs> um, I suggest carrying a rope because you just never know when you need to pull a tarp out to make yourself some coverage from the rain or whatever. Or, I mean, you can pull it. You know, you can pull a rig probably with it if you do enough loops with it, whatnot. So very, very comfortable. Actual camping gear. There's food. Yeah. So pots and pans. Definitely suggest these butane stoves. I found to be very nice. They're okay to be used interior. I don't know if you've seen a lot of uh, Asian restaurants to use them for heating up the food at your table. Um, they carry this kind of canister. You can get them again at like a cash and carry store or whatever. You can get probably well, a pack, pack of 10 for fairly cheap. It's very cheap fuel. Um, and it does good in the cold versus propane because propane will freeze up and not work as good for you. Um, and then just carry, you know, like a gas lantern. I found rem mounts to work nicely, a suction cup to LED light like this. And you can mount it to any glass in any position plug it in and it can run all night long and you got lights I mean it's, it's very very sufficient efficient and then just whatever you know grocery wise whatever food wise you want to carry with you I mean, we're not gonna go into details of food because everybody likes their own different cuisines I guess um, so that covers as far as gear that I carry personally Where's that paper I had? oh here's a sleeping bag option I think it was Box of buy one. Pullman. It's fleece inside, so no matter how you get inside, it's always gonna be warm for you, like literally a matter of seconds. If you get one that's like a silky feel to it, it'll take a little time for it to warm up. Just something to keep in mind. So, what to pack? Gear needed. Front and rear recovery points, either tow hooks or during shackles. So like, let's look at the Jeep here, it's really simple. So these are again the shackles. You want to make sure that this spot is dead on connected to your frame. 